we now introduce the thermal equation for an ideal gas. This is the equation that governs the evolution of temperature in a gas as that gas moves and changes. The temperature equation under an adiabatic assumption, so adiabatic, which means no exchange, adiabatic, no exchange of heat between parcels of fluid, is this, d by dt, partial derivative of temperature, plus u dot grad t, plus gamma minus one times the temperature times the divergence of the velocity u is equal to zero. This first set of terms here, this is the Lagrangian derivative of temperature, dt dt. And so we can write this in an alternative form, in a, in a Lagrangian form, by saying dt dt, the Lagrangian derivative of t, is equal to minus gamma minus 1 times t times the divergence of u. We can learn quite a bit from this equation as it is right here. Um, first, this is a scalar equation. Um, it is the evolution of t, which is a scalar variable. Um, and there are vector terms like div of u, but this is contracted div dot u. So this is itself a scalar term, and it's giving the expansion or contraction, expansion or contraction of the fluid as it, as it is squeezed and compressed. Now, from this already, we can immediately learn something about the evolution of temperature in an ideal gas. Um, if the gas is compressed, well, in that case, if it's, if it's squeezed, if we take the gas and we squeeze a parcel of it, we squeeze it from all sides, that means that the divergence of the velocity is less than zero. So then div dot u is less than zero, and the temperature goes up because the div dot u is less than zero, it gets hit with a minus sign, and so the temperature goes up, t goes up. So when an ideal gas is compressed, its temperature goes up and it gets hotter. If gas instead expands, so now we have our, our parcel of gas, and now we expand it outwards, well now the divergence of u is a positive quantity, and when hit with the negative sign, div dot u is greater than zero, now the temperature decreases, the gas cools down on expansion. And you may have experiences with this if you have either um, pumped, uh, pumped air into a closed container and then felt that container get hotter, that's from the compression, um, or if you use like a, a can of pressurized gas and you um, release a bunch of gas out of it, then the, the can will get very cold and maybe even um, condense frost out on the sides as it, as it chills down. Um, one, one thing that's interesting to me is that these changes in temperature, they're proportional to not only the, um, the amount of expansion or contraction, but also the temperature of the gas to begin with. Um, and in fact, it's a, it's a fractional or, or logarithmic derivative sense of change. And to, to show that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write down an alternative form of this derivative, which can be a useful way to think about it. d log t dt. And this is equal to minus gamma minus 1 times the divergence of u. And th this form comes about because um, the, the logarithmic derivative, um, this is 1 over t times the quantity 
uh, d by dt of t plus u dot grad t, as we've seen in, in other cases before. And we arrived at this by taking our adiabatic temperature equation and just dividing across a 1 over t. So this tells us that um, the, the temperature in a gas changes in a, in a logarithmic sense, in a, in a fractional sense, as we expand or compress that gas. That has important implications for pumping of gases um, and also for um, how gases um, change and evolve under, under compressible motions when the divergence of U is non-zero. All right, uh, the, the effect is gamma dependent. Um, how much the temperature changes depends, um, as you can see here, on gamma. It depends on the temperature sum, um, but it depends on, on gamma even more. Um, if, if gamma is large, if gamma is, is big, if it's far from 1, then, um, then uh, delta T is big. There's a, there's a large change of T when gamma is bigger than 1 with any expansion or compression. And 1 is a special value because gamma shows up as gamma minus 1. And so it's, it's when it's, it's particularly far from 1 that you get large effects. And we can think of, a, of this as being a, a large, large thermal or potential thermal feedback. And we might think of the gas as being a, a stiff gas. When you, when you compress it or expand it, uh, the gas... It, it responds stiffly. There's, there's a big response in the temperature and hence possibly also in the pressure for an ideal gas. Now, conversely, if uh, gamma is pretty close to 1, if it's, if it's sort of epsilon away from 1, then um, uh, the, the temperature response from expansion or compression is tiny. Um, and there's not very much feedback. So it would be a small, small thermal feedback. And we might think of a gas in terms of its compressibility then as being a, a squishy gas. Um, you, you squish it, you compress it, and it doesn't really push back against you. There isn't much temperature and pressure response. Um, and similarly, you, you expand the gas, and there isn't much cooling response that, that counteracts that expansion. All right. So um, as, a, as a reminder, gamma is itself uh, is the adiabatic exponent. So gamma, uh, the adiabatic exponent, adiabatic exponent, Um, for, for an ideal gas, there, there are a bunch of different exponents. There's uh, a capital gamma 1, and there's a capital gamma 2, and there's a capital gamma 3. Each of these are logarithmic derivatives of um, different thermodynamic quantities, um, like d log rho, d log p, and other things like this. Um, and all of these are the same and equal to little gamma for an ideal gas. And for an ideal gas, little gamma is also the ratio of the specific heats, uh, Cp over Cv, with Cp the heat at constant pressure, and Cv the specific heat at constant volume. And generally, this is a quantity greater than 1. Um, and Typical values of gamma are, um, are like so. So uh, gamma might be equal to 5 thirds for a monotonic ideal gas. So this would be something like fully ionized, uh, fully ionized hydrogen. Um, where you only have protons. Um, 
only protons and electrons flying around. Um, it's seven fifths for a diatomic gas. So this is something like N2 or O2 or other um, diatomic molecules that show up typically, especially in cooler planetary atmospheres, H2, very important in things like the, the gas giants. Um, and another special value is for thirds, and this is for a photon gas or a rel relativistic gas. Um, and this happens especially, um, this happens in astrophysics in extreme events when you have extremely high luminosities and radiation dominated systems, like in um, accretion disks or AGN um, or uh, O-type stars and other um, massive stars on the main sequence. Um, they or supernovas. They can all be in, in sort of these kinds of categories where there's a radiation dominated flow potential. Now, there's, a, there's one other way that, that gamma can can change. And one might ask, um, can gamma, um, uh, can gamma approach one? Um, and there's a, there's a special way that you can get near one. And that's if you're in an ionizing gas. Um, so if you're ionizing a gas, like, um, a hydrogen gas, so if you, if you take this to about um, 10 to the 4 Kelvin, you start taking H and you break it up into H plus plus E minus. And you've done two things. Um, you've sunk energy into a phase transition, into going from H to these two things. And you've also created two different particles that are running around, which generally increases the pressure of the system. And so the, the combination of these two things means that CV goes up by a lot more. Now let me see if I can write this here. So CV goes up by a bunch for a little change in CP. And so gamma approaches one. And if we, if we can solve this for a pure hydrogen gas, um, and I'm gonna show you some results here from Clayton uh, Clayton, uh, 1983, a uh, classic book on stellar structure. And if you look at the value for gamma sub one, which for an ideal gas is also little gamma, against the ionization fraction, fraction ionized, then um, you'll get a, a particular curve you get a curve that comes down like this and comes up like this from an ionization fraction of zero to a fully ionized gas. Now, as we, as we saw up here, the fully ionized value is um, 5 thirds, and this, this floor value down here is about one. And this minimum here occurs at about a 50% ionization fraction. Um, and this minimum value is actually 1.1 three, five, roughly, um, which is a value that's quite close to one compared to five thirds, um, right? This is uh, 1.666. So you can get uh, a gas that's very close to a gamma of one in ionization zones. Where does this happen? Um, inside stars like the sun, uh, as you drop below the photosphere, which is about 6,000 Kelvin for the sun, the temperature increases. And so you go from a neutral, non-ionized hydrogen gas here, and you heat up the parcel as it drops down inside the sun, and you end up with a fully ionized parcel down here at temperatures greater than about 10,000 Kelvin. And in between, when you've ionized it, you've gone to a, a gamma-1 gas, or nearly one, and you've lost a lot of the thermal response in the system to compressibility. Um, and this, this brings about various instabilities in these mixed systems. And we can find this also in some other um, chemically dominated systems, which, which are of interest throughout atmospheres and stellar interiors.